The next part, next subsection I'd like to show you, I called Celtic Britain. And here again we have a late 18th century painting, a neoclassical painting uh, by a British artist called John Opie and it shows Queen Boudicca, one of the legendary heroines of Celtic Britain, um, rediscovered later as the image of um, patriotic significance because she was uh, the leader of one of the Celtic tribes who led a mass rebellion against the, uh, against the um, Roman invasion. So um, we have this uh, militant woman dressed up as some sort of ancient goddess. She looks a little bit like the goddess Athena with a helmet and uh, there are some people around her. There is a, a defenseless looking young girl that is sheltered by her. According to the legend, the uh, fact that um, inspired Boudicca to her rebellion was uh, when the Romans raped her two young daughters. So these are probably the girls that she is sheltering. Plus some um, men, probably Celtic warriors, listening to her and uh, gathering strength to fight the Romans. Uh, this is still before the, um, the common era, so we move from, uh, let's see, the third millennium BCE to the sixth or fifth century BCE. So this is much closer to our uh, times, uh, but still uh, long before Christianity, for example, and even uh, at least partially before, uh, before the Romans. Uh, so what survives of the Celtic period are also some remains of human settlements, especially the so-called hill forts. So the, um, uh, the um, earth walls and dikes that protected the villages or small towns usually located on the tops of hills. Uh, there are some surviving, uh, surviving um, relics of those hill forts in places like Hampshire or uh, Dorset, probably the most famous one, the best preserved, as you can see, especially from this aerial photograph, is called Maiden Castle Hill Fort in Dorset. This is from 6th uh, century BCE. And this is the moment when we really start having very characteristic, works of art with what later and until today is known as the Celtic designs, the Celtic ornaments. So those very uh, beautiful and uh, intricately made um, geometric um, decorations um, that were used um, to, um, to embellish usually objects of um, social significance, so jewellery and luxury objects and also ceremonial um, weapons or ceremonial um, armour. Uh, rather than, let's say, the kind of weapons that would be uh, really used by warriors during the battles, uh, we have some ceremonial shields or uh, or swords that uh, uh, that uh, would be used as status symbols and sometimes they would be buried with their owner uh, with their owners in the graves we have some uh, some uh, examples here uh, most of them the vast majority come from the British Museum uh, site so if you want to, to know more or to see uh, the photographs from another perspective or whatever, uh, go to the site of the British Museum and just look at all these beautiful things. Uh, for example, um, an Iron Age gold collar found in Nottinghamshire. This type of collar, um, which is made of, uh, of as you can see, um, 
quite a lot of gold, so it was very expensive. And if you look at the uh, artistic quality of the decorations, this was this was immensely uh, important status symbol. This is called a cork, so it's like a bracelet basically, but to be worn uh, to be worn on the uh, on the neck. Another type of uh, necklace, quite popular for Celtic culture, is called a lunula. Um, Luna is the, uh, the Latin term for the moon and this uh, type of necklace really looks like a kind of crescent moon uh, which uh, makes um, many of the art historians and cultural historians and archaeologists uh, believe that uh, uh, the astronomical calendar and the phases of the sun and the moon and the seasons were still very important uh, for the Celtic religion. Uh, this type of necklace could be worn perhaps by um, priests or priestesses and this uh, um, connected them to the moon. Uh, it's made of precious metals, um, gold or silver uh, so it's quite um, a quite um, valuable of course and uh, symbolically significant as well. Another thing uh, also from Northamptonshire is a hand mirror uh, found in the village of Desborough. Uh, this is from around the 1st century AD, so this is around the time when the Romans uh, come to Britain, uh, but the Celtic culture continues. And if you look at the kind of decorations on the other side of the mirror, this was not a, um, a glass mirror or crystal mirror, mirror. this was made of, uh, of polished metal. So one side was polished to a very... Um, reflective surface, the other side was decorated with those quintessentially Celtic designs. So we have um, those beautiful uh, geometric shapes. If you look at the, uh, at the Iron Age uh, torque again, the, these shapes are quite similar, they're kind of um, crescent shaped and they are, they are made from the, from the fragments of a circle. Um, so, uh, very intricate geometric designs, uh, uh, also beautiful metal work. If you look at the handle of the, uh, of the mirror, you have those uh, woven designs decorating the handle itself. The next thing is uh, um, a ceremonial shield from uh, uh, Iron Age again, so um, the turn of the eras basically if you think about that. Uh, this was um, uh, this was discovered in one of the burial sites and uh, according to the archaeologists this is too precious and too delicate to be really used in, uh, in battle and it shows no sign of, of uh, uh, battle damage, uh, so probably this was just a ceremonial shield uh, um, status symbol. Uh, we start having first uh, images of, um, uh, of animals and humans, such as those little figures or ornaments um, in the shape of a horse head or horse mask perhaps very stylized. It's like a kind of combination of the shape of animal's head with the geometric kind of uh, flowing uh, lines of the Celtic designs. And we also have a small bronze figure showing a human head. So you can um, look at the faces a little bit like to see what kind of um, what kind of uh, hairstyles and uh, moustache was fashionable in this period. So we really start having the images of, um, of humans. Um, 
some other elements of Celtic culture that are very widespread throughout the Celtic lands. So once again, uh, this is Ireland, this is, um, this is uh, uh, some parts of uh, Western France, especially the, the area uh, called Brittany. Um, we have uh, some types of objects that are repeating, like the musical instruments. Here we have some musical instruments, usually kinds of horns to be blown, uh, found in, uh, in Ireland, uh, and also cauldrons, so big ceremonial vessels. Some archaeologists believe that uh, these were used for religious ceremonies to actually brew those hallucino hallucinogenic potions that uh, the members of the, uh, of the community would take. So um, what I would like you to remember, what I would like you to notice is that uh, Britain is not an island. Well, actually, um, uh, originally it was not an island, it became an island um, during the, uh, the melting of the, uh, of the snow and ice uh, of the last um, ice age. And, um, uh, culturally speaking, it is connected to the civilization of, uh, of the region. And when the Romans come, this really continues. So the next part uh, here is Roman Britain, and here we have a mid-Victorian um, image, a mural from the north of England, uh, by uh, William Bell Scott. Uh, the Romans caused a wall to be built. Of course, this is Hadrian's Wall. This is one of the great monuments of Roman presence in, uh, in Britain. And um, in the Victorian period, uh, something interesting happens in the perception of the Roman invasion because, uh, well, Britain was becoming an empire and Rome had been an empire before. So the... Um, uh, the um, belief, like which side in this conflict, is it the Celts or the Romans, is our side, like we, the British people, especially of the Victorian period, are we the descendants of the Romans or the Celts? Um, it was generally believed that the Roman culture was more developed. Uh, they had uh, the written culture, they had uh, literature and philosophy and politics and all this, um, uh, all the all the things that uh, the Celts apparently didn't, or at least not as um, as much of it. Uh, but they were invaders, so um, this is a, a slightly tricky moment for the for the British and the British artists as well. Uh, the Victorian artists sometimes show this tension, so usually it shows a kind of uh, a Roman soldier uh, or Roman um, occupying force falling in love with uh, Celtic women. There are quite a lot of Victorian images. You get Potek, Poluje. Don't let him hunt. Um, falling in love uh, with uh, Celtic women and uh, and um, combining the native Celtic elements with the higher civilization of uh, of um, Rome. So there we go. Yes, we have a cat. You'll see him eventually, probably. And he's getting crazy because it's a lot of snow and uh, birds are feeding him. Yeah, you'll see him. Sooner or later you'll see him. His name is Watson. So back to Roman Britain. Um, Roman culture becomes dominant, becomes the chosen culture of the rich sections of the British society, of the Celtic British society. And uh, some places, uh, um, especially when the excavations um, revealed the uh, elements of uh, Roman villas, 
these villas did not uh, belong to um, the Roman administrators necessarily. They could just as well belong to native aristocracy or the, the rich members of the Celtic society that started to adopt Roman style, Roman art. Uh, and what we have in places such as, um, for example, um, Fishburn, a uh, Roman palace in West Sussex, or Lallingstone Villa in Kent, so it's mostly in the, in the south of England, as you can see, is also linking Britain to larger pan-European civilization. So we have the kind of art that you will find anywhere in the Roman occupied lands. Uh, so, throughout the vast Roman Empire, you have things like mosaics, for example. So, uh, the floor decorations uh, consisting of small um, stones uh, um, arranged uh, to show some ge uh, geometric motifs, but also figurative scenes. They could be uh, scenes from Roman mythology and Roman mythology, Roman religion becomes very widespread. Actually the Romans take over some elements of Celtic culture and just give them Roman names. This is what they did. This was a polytheistic culture. So whenever they encountered new gods and new forms of worship, they just took it as their own. They might give it some recognizable Roman name, but otherwise they just took it. So um, we have some uh, elements that are that are true to um, the entirety of Roman civilization. So the mosaics showing scenes from classical mythology, either originally Roman or borrowed from the Greeks like the abduction of Europe here in Lullingstone. Uh, we have a female figure seated on a white bull being carried away. Uh, we have uh, images of winged uh, children, so the image of Eros. Here we have uh, from Fishburne, uh, Eros on a dolphin. Uh, we have um, some more uh, scenes from uh, from classical mythology, like the hero Bellerophon slaying the Hymera, so a kind of mythological monster. Uh, actually, all around in those kind of round um, uh, circles uh, uh, on this mosaic, we have the personifications of the four seasons of the year. So it's not all mythology. We have some symbolism. We have some geometry. Uh, as well. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of crafts that are typical to the Roman culture, uh, like uh, <coughs> sculpture, like here, uh, <coughs> uh, a little figure of the god Mercury, mostly the god of trade, but also the god of thieves. Uh, from Colchester, one of the uh, one of the cities that were actually uh, established by the Romans. We have some some um, modern cities, the cities that survive until today, that were started, that were originated by the Romans. So Colchester is one of them, Chester is another. Chester, this is actually going back uh, linguistically to the Latin castrum, which means uh, an encampment, later a castle. Uh, we have um, pottery with uh, some uh, decorative scenes. Uh, it's quite interesting. The the scene of the hunting scene from this clay pot. Uh, it's actually more Celtic than Roman, but it was used in uh, Roman Colchester. Uh, there is Roman glass, so glass working becomes uh, known in Britain. Actually, if you watch this um, uh, Britain BC and Britain AD, um, I guess they say at one point something very interesting that um, glass objects were for the rich to drink wine and the clay objects were for the poorer sections of the society to drink beer. So they tend to be more 
local in the style of decoration. Then of course we have um, uh, some architectural remains like the uh, Hadrian's Wall which I already mentioned. So the wall itself, the protective barrier to, to um, uh, shield the Roman lands uh, from the, uh, the danger of the Scots and the Picts up north uh, and also the, uh, the uh, forts and uh, uh, military buildings alongside the, uh, the wall mm -hmm. like here, house that's a uh, Roman fort. Uh, this, is, this is the north of England, this is Northumberland uh, and um, if you go there, parts of the wall are actually very well preserved. The wall itself is more than 100 kilometers long, but parts of the wall itself and uh, some of the remains of the forts that every, I don't know, 20-30 kilometers there was a fort or some other settlement uh, guarded by the Romans uh, to protect the wall. You can go and, uh, and see these things. They, they were not deliberately artistic, but they really give you the idea of the power of the Roman Empire. Um, another very important and very well preserved site is the Roman Baths in the city of Bath. So this is one of the places where Romans actually came and found the existing shrine. This was not um, uh, a day spa or anything like that. This was a healing shrine based on the natural uh, mineral springs uh, but the idea was that people uh, looking for, um, for healing uh, would go there, pray to a local deity uh, whose name was Sulis and ritually bathe in those mineral springs. They worked because, well, um, mineral waters are very, um, very good for your health. When the Romans came, they loved it. It uh, uh, reminded them of their own um, tradition of uh, baths and bathhouses and the fact that these were natural um, hot springs even made it better. So um, they found a shrine to the goddess Sulis and they just took it over. They called it Minerva Solis and uh, um, redeveloped and expanded the, um, uh, the shrine. Uh, this place was very very important uh, for Roman Britain and also uh, enjoyed a renewed uh, time of great popularity and uh, mass um, interest in the 18th century. So we will return to Bath in the 18th century to see the Bath of uh, the Georgian period, the Bath of the Regency period, uh, uh, but uh, of course the original site was Celtic but then it was taken over, redeveloped and expanded by the Romans. So if you ever go to Bath, and it's a beautiful place to visit, um, make sure you go to the, <clears throat> to the Roman Bath as well. We have some, uh, some small objects, uh, so the metal working continues. We have some uh, elements found in, uh, in the so-called treasure um, hordes. So uh, sometime later somebody probably uh, buried the uh, valuables um, because they were afraid of some, um, I know, invader army or, or someone like that and uh, they never came back. Only much, much later these uh, sites were discovered, usually accidentally, by archaeologists and uh, lots of interesting things, <coughs> things were found. Like this <coughs> uh, Empress uh, pepper pot uh, from uh, uh, from the Roman period, showing this uh, this uh, uh, human figure, and originally used to store expensive spices. All this uh, um, beautiful silver. Can you see Watson? This is Watson. If you can see him. Uh, yes. This is my cat assistant and he will be coming here probably um, many times during this semester.
each stop. <laughs> so we have this uh, little female tiger uh, or lion uh, figure uh, made of silver. As you can see, it's uh, it's a beautiful, uh, very stylized uh, image of uh, of an animal uh, with very uh, visible teeth. So probably, um, maybe there were there were some young ones uh, feeding um, from the the milk of the mother, and there is this beautiful gold belt buckle from another Roman treasure found in Norfolk. It uh, combines Celtic and Roman elements again. So this human figure is probably some hero, very likely, uh, very likely um, Dionysus or maybe Hercules. So, um, it looks a lot like those Roman statues and Roman nudes, uh, but the uh, the kind of C-shaped part of the buckle that you can see here um, includes stylized images of horses' heads again. So, yeah, it was never uncontaminated. So the Celtic culture continues throughout the Roman period, and as you will see. Uh, in a little while, also later in the Anglo-Saxon period, in the Christian period, and uh, it never really goes away. So we continue in a moment.